we're going to talk about today is something that we are the best in the world at. And um, most of the times you think it's about genetics or something else, but uh, this is the chance for us to go deeper and interrogate Kenyan expertise and see what really happens down there. This is what we see in the media. Uh, we've won medals. That's Vivian over there. That's when they did the 5,000 meters at the Africa Championships in 2010. And this is what we see in the media locally. Uh, they're winning medals and they're running. But basically, how does this guy in the Rift Valley go to become this guy who's being interviewed by all the media over here? So I think we have to start at the system. What happens? And basically, this is a training session. It's called the Sun Salute Yoga Session. And in here is somebody who's been running for three months and the most dominant athlete in the world right now. In here is Stacy Chapiegon, and in here is David Rudisha. So this is like having you from Madari uh, Sports Club, Madari Youth Sports Club, training with Messi. So you're all in the same place. You're eating the same food. Uh, you're doing the same routine. Of course, you know, Rudisha's routine may be quite higher than Faith's, but you're in the same place. So you're learning from each other and you're constantly pitting yourself against the best. So this is Brother Colm O'Connell, an Irishman who came here in 1976 and is uh, Kenya's longest serving coach. And this is the youth camp in St. Patrick's Iten. So basically what happened, he came here he found a system that was producing some good athletes. Mike Boyd, uh, 1972, Munich Olympics, a uh, silver medalist in the 800 meters. And, but what he did was he took that system that was being um, practiced in St. Patrick's and he started inviting people from other schools, all the local schools, all the local primaries, all the best athletes from the secondary schools in the area. And what ended up happening is that in the last 20 years, he has produced uh, 2,000 athletes. 200 of them have gone on to become international. Names such as Janet Chepkoske, uh, the world champion. Names such as Ed Edna Kiplagat, the world champion. Names such as Vivian Cheriot, the double world champion. Uh, and basically what his system did is that it gave equal opportunity to male and female runners and such that if you notice that in 2011, Kenya won 17 medals in the World Championships. Six of them were from men, 11 were from women. And that was the first time that had happened. Yeah. So as you can see again here, it's, it's very egalitarian. Eh? That's David Rudisha, most dominant athlete in the world right now. He's carrying the yoga mats. Eh? The young people are like, let David carry it. I mean, he's the strongest one here. So, uh, and then those are some of the young athletes. You can see that's, that's like a 13-year-old and training with him right there. And so let's look at the setting where this happens. Uh, it's a 10. You know, it's quiet, rural. Uh, there's time to contemplate. There's time to sit down. There's time to develop something. And... Um, you know, look at the air is like supremely clean over there. You know, 8,000 feet. Your blood just starts feeling good when you're up there. Uh, <laughs> and, and so this thing happens in a certain place. And it, the system that has been put in place by people like Brother Combe, by people like Patrick Sang, who was the Barcelona silver medalist and now runs a camp in Kaptagat. Uh, so they've put in place a system where the best training happens. And now that system can take advantage of things like the setting, can take advantage of the altitude, which makes your, your body produce more blood cells. So that when you run, when you go to lower altitude, you're able to utilize oxygen more efficiently. So that somebody who, you know, when you're sitting next to someone who's coming from low altitude, you're able to use oxygen to transport that, uh, you know, that's like fuel for your muscle and your energy processes become more efficient, and you're able to run faster and further. And there's a lot of settings where you can train. Like this is the forest um, in Keio, just on the way to Marraquet. And basically what happens here is that during the hot weather, at any time you can go here and train, and there's no dust, and it's cool, and you know, it's, it's just a nice serene environment where you can practice your sport. Let's talk about the training. C, 
six days a week, two to three times a day, 200 kilometers a week. Rain or shine. That is six o'clock in the morning. I have barely been woken up to go and photograph that. And that's the dedication. Because uh, if you don't do that, you're not going to get anywhere. There are 5,000 people in this country who are running at the highest level. You're only getting to see maybe 10 of them winning medals. Let's say 17, 20. So only 200 out of that 5,000 goes to international level. And only very few of them that we get to hear about. So it's a system. It's a pyramid. These are the journeymen. These are the everyday people that make that pyramid like reach the highest levels of the sport, the highest levels that have ever been seen in the history of this world. Maybe in another word. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so as you, you can see how many people are training. You know, you, this is a quarter of the field. This is about, you can see possibly about 20 people there. That's a quarter of the field. There are like maybe another 80 people on this side of the track. That's a very small section of the track. Yeah, that's a fat leg session. And this is like the most difficult training ever. It's called, it's part like, it, it builds speed and endurance. It's, it's a Swedish word meaning speed play. So basically what they do is two minutes fast, one minute slow. When that watch beeps, people take off like something is coming. And, you know, then you, you do your restorative jog. And like that, like that. So when you see a session, for example, where Patrick Macau, you know, at the Berlin Marathon, when you see him with Gabriel Selassie, and then he, you know, he tells the pacemakers, Twende, and then they all go, you know? They've practiced for that. That's not something that just came out of nowhere. I think after Patrick Macau broke his record, and then the next day all the radio stations were saying he won $1 million in, in two hours. That's just not possible. He's been doing this for 10 years before he got there. And what happens when you're the best woman in the world? When you can't find any other woman who can keep with you, keep up with you, you go and train with men. And that's Edna Kiplagat, the world champion. When they see her coming, all the men say, Aki Kushika, talk her to up. <laughs> so you can see, you're constantly pitting yourself against the best. There is no fear. You have to put yourself there. So that when you go and line up at the London Marathon, at the Olympics, you're ready. You're ready. And that's how you look after a session. That's not water. <laughs> this is Felix Limo. He has won the London Marathon, the Berlin Marathon, the Rotterdam Marathon, the Chicago Marathon. This is Alex Kipchirchir. And, you know, their bodies are like Formula One cars. You know, it has to be fixed and massaged and... <laughs> Taking care of, eh? After you're done, you have to take care of your body. That is what runs. That is your machine. That is what enables you to practice your art. And this is the life in training camp. Very Spartan. This place costs 1,500 shillings a month to live in. Those shoes cost 10,000 shillings. They do their own laundry. They grow their own vegetables. And the rookie in the camp is in charge of making sure no birds eat the vegetables. I think you can see the magnetic tape over there. And this is very, very dark, but uh, I hope you can see the fire over there. Very Spartan, three stone fire. And that's how they, you know, that's how they live. And that, right there, serving that tea. I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's someone serving tea. That's a London Marathon champion serving tea to everyone else. So again, very egalitarian, very Spartan. And lots of rest, lots of rest. Because when your body is performing at that level, you need to be sleeping maybe two hours in the middle of the day. So rest is just as important of training and it forms uh, an important part of the regime. And what happens now when you've put together this training regime in Kenya? So you go to Europe, Asia, America to train. So this is uh, Wilson Keegan, just before the Berlin, uh, no, Hamburg Marathon in Germany. As you can see, that's the chip that he's going to, do, that's going to measure uh, how he's running. Basically, that chip is very important. If you don't cross the mat 
every five kilometers with that ship, you're disqualified from the race. That is how they know you actually ran the race. Not somebody else you didn't sneak in like I used to do in high school. <laughs> That's how they know you ran the race. That's how when you see a five kilometer split when you're watching the London Marathon or the World Championships, then you see the names coming up after every five kilometers. It's computerized. That's what does that. And that's a manager. And how the infrastructure works is that they train here in Kenya, they get managers, agents, who go and look for them races in Europe or America or Asia or whatever. And then they go and race. And because they're running to be professionals, because they're running to make a living, then when the national championships come, they're already at peak performance, and that's how we're winning gold medals. This... Uh, Wilson's drinks before he, that are going to be put on the route for the uh, marathon. This is for five kilometers. That's for 10 kilometers. That's for 15. Five kilometers has more energy drinks. By the time it's getting to f the last water station at 40, it has more caffeine so that, you know, it can give him that last extra boost. So it's very scientific. Nothing here has not been planned. Nothing here has not been thought of. And then that's the result. That's what's happening now when you put all these things together. And the things that running has built, those are buildings in Eldoret, belong to runners. A clue is usually it's named after a foreign city where the money was won. <laughs> Johannesburg, Rieti, eh? Rotterdam, all these are buildings in Eldoret. And when you see them, you'll know why they're named like that now. As well as children, Helsinki and Berlin. <laughs> Again, the things that running has built. And what happens? How do you start to have ambition? You look at something that someone has done next to you and how they have improved their lives. And you say, that person is just like me. I can do this. So when the young runners pass here, they're like, this person, you know, was in the same school as me. As they were eating the same thing as me. And, you know, you're coming from a society that maybe doesn't have so much. So you're saying, if they can do this and get this, then I can do this so that I can make my life better. And it's a very basic human emotion and ambition to, to, to better your state and that of your family and of future generations uh, around you. And so hopefully that is how the story of how this runner becomes this runner at The Hague. We don't do all bad things at The Hague. <laughs> Yes, and uh, thank you very much.